Boldwood presents The Bordeaux Book Club, written by Gillian Harvey and read by Lucy Scott. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Prologue George was just stepping out of the café, takeaway coffee in hand, when he saw Grace appear in the window of the tabac opposite. He recognised her instantly, despite his throbbing temples, and felt his neck prickle as he remembered trying to talk to her at the gardening club meet and finding his tongue had tied itself in knots. It had shocked him, this sudden mutism. He'd always been able to talk for England, so everyone told him. But then again, he wasn't in England any more, and he'd felt a bit out of place amongst all those posh retirees. The cold, silvery winter light crept softly around the edges of the white February clouds and fell on Grace's skin as she searched for an empty place in the window. Reaching up, her tongue protruding slightly at the edge of her mouth, she pressed the corners of the A4 sheet against the glass alongside the adverts for a local artisan market, a babysitting service, and a poster advertising a music night, the date of which had already passed. He could just make out the word... Club in bold on the paper. Another club? He tried not to laugh. He barely knew the woman, but he'd gathered that if there was an event or a club or fete or pretty much anything going on in the local community, she'd be involved somehow. He wondered what she was up to this time. He busied himself, looking at the property adverts in the estate agent window while he waited for her to leave. Then, when she had... "'strolled nonchalantly across the street and had a quick gander. "'Sure enough, it was an advert for a new organisation, "'with Grace at its helm. "'This time, it seemed, she was starting a book club for Anglophones, "'the advert written in English, with French translation underneath, "'in the hope of attracting a wider clientele. "'He wasn't sure why he took a picture of the number with his phone. "'Just in case,' he told himself. He hadn't read a book for years, not a fiction one at least, but maybe it was time. Another night in with the boys at the house would probably finish him off. He was getting too old for so much alcohol, and he couldn't just sit around in his tiny flat. He'd go mad. At least it would be something to do. The noise of Monica's phone made her jump. She hated the way its shrill sound pierced the silence, bouncing from the high ceilings and wooden floors, which magnified the noise horribly. Bella's limbs stiffened in her arms, and Monica shushed her baby j Moving Bella onto her other shoulder, she picked up the mobile, expertly navigating its screen one-handedly with dexterous use of her thumb. It was from Peter. It said simply, Saw this? She clicked on the attached photo to enlarge it and saw an ad for the Bordeaux Book Club, for English speakers. She looked instinctively at the book, spine cracked, that she'd placed face down on the table when Bella had cried, but found herself shaking her head, although there was nobody there to witness it. Could she manage it? It was hard work simply changing nappies and preparing bottles. Anything for herself seemed to have taken a back seat since Bella arrived and she could only imagine the sort of people who'd be there. Probably a bunch of retirees desperate to read war stories or drink red wine while discussing the latest John Grisham. Still, she had promised herself she'd make more connections locally, and this was a chance to at least do something different, to keep her busy while Peter was away. What do you think? Peter messaged. She replied, Maybe. Alfie placed his rucksack at his feet, then lifted his phone and took a quick snap of the advert. It could be just the thing he'd been looking for. Something that could prove uplifting, a distraction from the worst parts of life. He slipped the phone back in the pocket of his jeans and shouldered his backpack with a sigh of effort. Camille left the shop, slipping a pack of cigarettes into her bag. You have found something? she asked him in French. Maybe, he said shrugging. A book club for English speakers. She raised an eyebrow. For... He nodded. It's just... Well, it might work, you know. Perhaps I should come too, 
she suggested, to improve my English? He nodded. Yeah, if you want. They turned and walked slowly down the road, disappearing into the melange of pedestrians, making their way to work or university, or strolling more slowly, with no particular destination in mind. A little further along the road, she slipped her hand in his, and he squeezed it gratefully. You will find a way, she told him softly. He wanted to thank her, but the words stuck in his throat. Instead, he looked forward intently until the moment passed, then murmured a short, Hope so. Then they turned the corner and were swallowed into the heart of Bordeaux, just a couple of students on their way to class. Grace sounded almost breathless on the phone. Four inquiries already, she told Leah. As usual, Grace's enthusiasm made Leah feel slightly drained. She resolved to rummage in Grace's medical cabinet next. Whatever it was, Leah needed a healthy dose of it herself. Despite being almost fifteen years Grace's junior, she often found herself ready for bed by nine o'clock, whereas Grace's restless energy often kept her up and active into the wee small hours. So you'll come, Grace said. Um... Well, do you need me to? Leah asked hesitantly. I mean, it sounds as if it might be a, well, a nice size already. She longed to say no, rehearsing the word in her head. But somehow it wouldn't come. What was it about Grace? Something about her manner, her confidence made Leah feel she ought to agree with everything she said. Of course you must come, Grace responded, missing Leah's reluctant tone entirely. Won't be the same without you. Leah doubted this very much, seeing as she would probably end up sitting in the corner and watching others talk about books she might not find the time to read. But she found herself agreeing anyway. How does she do it? she asked Nathan as he walked into the hallway a few minutes later, banging his gloved hands together in an attempt to warm them up. Who? Scarlet? he asked, glancing at the stairs as if their teenage daughter might suddenly make a rare appearance from her room. No, Grace, I always tell myself I'm going to say no to things and I end up agreeing. She slipped her phone into her pocket and walked through with him into the kitchen. He laughed. You have to admit, she does get people involved. Which is great if they want to be, she said, only she can't seem to take the hint. Did you actually tell her you didn't want to do it? He asked, sitting in the chair opposite and beginning to worry at the knot in his shoelaces. Well, not in so many words. He fixed his eyes on her. Well then, he said. I know, but she's... Well, you know, Grace, she said weakly. <laughs> that I do whether I want to or not. He smiled and she found herself grinning back. Exactly. So what are you going to do? He asked, picking an apple from the fruit bowl and biting into it hungrily. I guess I'm going. I mean, I think she probably just wants the moral support of a friend. And I do always say I ought to read more, she said. He nodded. Well then, sounds like it's a problem solved. Chapter 1. February As you can see, it's quite the spread, Grace said proudly, gesturing towards the coffee table on which she'd laid out an array of different biscuits, all homemade of course, stacked on an elaborate three-tier stand. She'd asked Leah to arrive a little earlier than the others, to be there to chat to newcomers, if Grace got tied up answering for an event that promised four or five guests at most. But she'd agreed, because when it came to Grace, for some reason, she always did. She'd pulled up outside Grace's house at six. As she'd exited the car, she'd seen her friend standing in her warmly lit living room, hand to mouth, looking uncertain, almost fragile for a moment. Then she'd turned and noticed Leah's car, smiled and given a small wave. It's lovely, Grace, Leah said now, glancing at her watch and hoping beyond hope that she wouldn't be the only one to turn up. Grace seemed supremely confident, supremely Grace, that there'd be several attendees, but somehow her confidence only seemed to inflate Leah's own worry and doubt that the evening might not be the success Grace hoped for. 
as if Leah had absorbed any negativity into herself and held it on behalf of her friend. Grace's sitting room was spotless as always, wooden furniture, painstakingly chalk-painted in pastel colours, parquet floor shining from a recent polish. Grace had an eye for furniture and a penchant for upcycling, and had even reupholstered the vintage sofa herself a few years ago. The only part of the room that wasn't gleaming was the area by the bay window, where Grace's bookshelves stood stuffed with texts, ramshackle and disorganised, and somehow at odds with everything else in the house. But then Grace was an avid reader. She probably enjoyed rifling through and pulling out books and simply didn't have time to rearrange them every week. Once, when Leah had mentioned them, she'd given a dismissive wave towards the disorderly shelves and simply said, Oh, I'll get to it. I just never seem to have the time. When the doorbell finally chimed, Leah's hand jerked, sending coffee whirling in her mug, but thankfully not sufficiently to make a spill. She felt a flood of relief that it wouldn't just be the pair of them. That'll be our first member, she said, in a voice that barely sounded like her own. She wondered sometimes why she felt such a loyalty to Grace. While they'd known each other a few years, they weren't particularly close. Perhaps it was because Grace had helped her and Nathan at the start, pointing them in the right direction for getting the permissions they needed for their home improvements and introducing them to several growers via the gardening group. Leah enjoyed her company, for the most part, but they'd never quite clicked in the way she had with friends back home. Before she could speculate further, the living room door opened and Grace appeared with a tall man at her side. He was dressed in paint-splashed jeans and enormous work boots and stood, hands in pockets, looking slightly awkward as she gestured. Have a Madeleine. Are you sure? It's... he said, indicating his far from pristine attire. I, I can always... Don't be ridiculous, Grace smiled. We don't stand on ceremony here, I can tell you. Leah took a sip of coffee to hide the incredulous look that no doubt appeared on her face at that moment, because Grace's home was very much her palace, and Leah knew better than to turn up in anything that might wreck the upholstery. But perhaps there were different rules for new recruits, she mused. Or maybe it was George's smile. He had one of those smiles, a kind of twinkling, relaxed grin that might have made even the inflexible Grace soften a little. George was just easing himself into one of the high-backed vintage armchairs when the bell rang again. Oh, said Grace, that'll be another one. She disappeared, leaving the two of them in sudden silence. Leah smiled awkwardly at George, balancing her coffee cup on her knees. So, she began, where did you... But before Leah could finish her sentence, Grace appeared again, a young man standing awkwardly by her side. He looked at Leah and George and the immaculate room and the three-tier cake stand and the piles and piles of books, and his cheeks flushed. This is Alfie, said Grace, giving him a gentle pat on the back, with perhaps a little too much force as the poor boy then stumbled forwards, encouraging him to join them. She smiled reassuringly, then turned to exit the room again. Hi, he said, blushing to his roots. He looked to be about twenty, only a few years older than Scarlet. Leah smiled, feeling her motherly instincts rise up. Take a seat, Alfie, she said, patting the sofa next to her. Thanks, he said, sinking into it, his hands clasped together as if he was perhaps praying for an escape route. Grace reappeared before they could settle into any sort of conversation, this time brandishing a tray with cups and a coffee pot, a jug of cream and a vintage sugar bowl complete with tongs. She was truly going all out for this gathering. So do you think that might be it for tonight? Leah asked her. Oh, I think there might be a couple more, but perhaps we ought to get going just in case, Grace said, smiling. There was a certain stiffness in her smile, something Leah noticed from time to time with her friend, as if her veneer had slipped slightly and someone altogether more vulnerable and unsure had appeared for a moment. Leah wondered whether Grace was disappointed at the turnout. Whatever it was, 
Her friend seemed to shake it off pretty quickly and stood, once everyone was catered for, clapping her hands together like a schoolteacher, commanding attention. So, she said, welcome, one and all. So, a book club. A chance to meet up, share our favourite books, expose ourselves to new authors, discuss and really get into literature, she beamed. I'm so glad I finally got around to arranging this, and thank you all so much for being here. The speech had perhaps been planned for a far bigger audience, but Grace soldiered on nonetheless. Let's start by introducing ourselves, she continued. I'm... But the doorbell interrupted them. Grace's face flooded with excitement at the prospect of another recruit, and she turned and whisked from the room, her pleated skirt billowing behind her. In the silence that followed, the three of them shifted uncomfortably. George reached forward and grabbed a ginger snap, biting into it and filling the room with the sound of crunching. Lovely biscuits, he said, between chomps. Yes, Grace is quite the... Uh, began Leah before stopping as Grace returned with a woman who had such glowing skin and glossy hair that she could have literally stepped out of one of the magazines Grace kept tidily in a sofa side rack. She was dressed casually in an enormous hoodie that perhaps belonged to her husband, with leggings protruding from beneath, but this didn't detract from her almost breathtaking beauty. This is Monica! Grace said, beaming. Come to join our little tribe. Hi, Monica, they said in unison, like children in a school assembly. Sorry I'm late, Monica said. Her voice was quiet, barely audible in comparison with Grace's booming tones. Not at all, not at all, Grace, who hated tidiness, said, still beaming. We're just glad you made it, aren't we? They all nodded and shuffled and quietly agreed. Leah wondered, not for the first time, whether Grace was wasted tucked away in a corner of rural France. She seemed to have an ability to take charge of any situation, to assume leadership and have it granted. A natural teacher, perhaps. And she knew Grace had spent years at the chalk face. But maybe she'd be even better placed as a counsellor or an army officer or, or president of the world. She'd soon whip everyone into shape and sort out those pesky little scraps the male leaders seem intent on having. So, Grace went on, and Leah experienced the little frisson of anxiety that came with realising you hadn't been paying attention. I vote we all choose one book, then come back together and discuss it each month. Perhaps each of us hosts one of the evenings. It could be the ideal way to ward off this winter and transition to sunnier days... She ended so triumphantly that Leah wondered whether they ought to clap. In the end, only Alfie gave in to the urge, banging his palms together twice into the... It was 7pm. Outside, the February darkness was just beginning to fall, and the solar lights that peppered Grace's perfectly organised garden began to glow as if in appreciation of Grace's efforts. Leah was the first to speak... Well, it sounds great, she said, smiling at her friend. Really positive. She meant it, too, she realised. While she hadn't been overjoyed at the prospect, now she was here and there were enough of them to make a decent go of it, she started to wonder whether the group might be just what she needed to get out of her reading slump. Or, well, her slump in general. She'd thought, before moving to France, that she'd have enough time to read as much as she wanted here, something she'd had to squeeze into her commutes or the brief moments of free time she'd had before bed in the past. But there was always something else to do, always work or the garden or something to sort out for Scarlet's school. At least this would force her to prioritise something more pleasant. I thought the first meeting could be at mine. Grace rose to her feet with a barely perceptible grimace of pain and walked over to the dresser that she'd rescued and repurposed with chalk paint last summer. Opening one of the drawers, she pulled out a stack of books and we agreed, didn't we, that we'd each choose a book. Mine's great expectations. Now, we don't have to start with this and I'm open to suggestions, but I just so happen to have accumulated a few copies of this one over the years... Such a favourite. I even managed to pick up a couple this week at the Anglophone book sale. 
so it might be easy to... She handed out the slightly worn copies like a teacher at the start of a lesson, smiling indulgently as each of her new recruits took one from her outstretched hand. Leah looked at the fellow members of what Grace had already named the Bordeaux Book Club and caught the eye of Alfie, who seemed to be regarding the brick of a book Grace had given him with a slight grimace on his face. Clearly no one was going to say anything, but Leah felt suddenly that the wrong choice at this stage might mean nobody turning up to the first real meeting. I wondered, she said, feeling nervous as if she was approaching a predator, whether we might start with something lighter. She nodded at Alfie as if to say, I've got your back. Because really, it was important to encourage young people to read and Dickens was quite an ambitious start for what was meant to be a casual, pleasant club experience. Grace wheeled around. Lighter, she said, her eyebrows raised. But this is great expectations. But perhaps something modern? Leah's mouth felt dry. Grace laughed. There's incredible humour in Great Expectations, and honestly, Dickens is timeless. What better than to read about the human experience, she said. All manner of life is here. She smiled at the rest of them, assuming their agreement. Of course, Leah said, sitting back. The springs of the vintage sofa creaked underneath her. It was just an idea. I have actually read. No, I think it sounds great, said George beaming at Grace before turning the book over in his hands and reading the back. Pip, he said, to no one in particular, as he scanned the blurb. He looked at Leah and gave an apologetic wink at having sided with Grace, and she smiled. Thanks, Grace, Monica said, as she received her own copy. She set it in her lap and drummed at it lightly with her long slender fingers. Leah noticed that all but one of her nails were chewed almost down to the skin, it's fine, Alfie said, turning the book over and over in his hands. My mum loves Dickens. George cleared his throat. And the Bordeaux? he inquired. Sorry? Grace turned, her blonde hair staying fixedly in position. Well, he said, running a nervous hand through his salt and pepper hair. I thought... I assumed when I saw the name that it was going to be a... Uh... Grace prompted, back in teacher mode. Well, he said, a wine club too. Whatever gave you that impression? Her voice sounded slightly sharp, as if she was insulted by the idea that her book group in itself wasn't enough to have tempted the four of them into her living room. The... George coloured slightly and shifted in his seat, still clutching his copy of the Dickens classic. Well, the Bordeaux bit. Oh! Grace seemed momentarily flummoxed. I suppose that was more of a location thing and, well, a bit of alliteration. Oh, it's just, aren't we in Sinak? Grace turned herself fully to face him. Sinak, Bordeaux, she said firmly. Grace was fond of describing herself as living in Bordeaux, and it wasn't the first time this had caused confusion. The first time Leah had popped round, she'd found that instead of the five-minute drive she'd imagined, she'd had to clock up thirty minutes to get to Grace's stone cottage, tucked away in a little commune, rather than in the heart of the city as she'd imagined. Right, George nodded, clearly embarrassed at his faux pas. A bit of wine could be fun, Leah ventured in an attempt to rescue him. She felt all eyes, Alfie, Monica, George and Grace, fix on her. Well, it would be nice if we all... Ch she suggested. Well, I suppose I'd already thought we'd sort out some nibbles while we talk, that kind of thing. Grace said after a moment's silence. The others, already in awe of Grace, it seemed, quickly agreed that yes, it did sound like a good idea. Bordeaux in Bordeaux, Leah quipped, hoping to appease herself in Grace's eyes. Yes, Grace could be a lot sometimes, bordering on interfering. But her heart seemed to be in the right place. It had taken Leah a little while to realise this, and in fact, she'd spent some of their initial weeks avoiding spending too much time with the woman. I don't want to encourage her, she'd told Nathan at the time. 
She'd sometimes heard people comment or gossip about Grace, once or twice heard her referred to as a busybody or a do-gooder, and she understood what they meant. A little of Grace went a long way at times. But there was good there, a desire to help underneath it all. Grace is always right, a mutual acquaintance had once said when they'd met up at a craft sale, and as long as she's always right, she's great company. Yes, said Grace at last, sinking into her chair, clutching three further copies of Great Expectations. Clearly, she'd been hoping for a larger showing. Yes, Bordeaux and Bordeaux, I like it. In fact, did I tell you I went to a wine tour recently to saint Emilion? She said, turning to Leah. I learned an awful lot about local grapes. Leah smiled, relieved that Grace had found she was still the voice of authority on all the matters relating to the group. Order was restored. A surreptitious look at her watch revealed it was quarter past seven. Outside, thick black darkness had absorbed everything except the dotted light of the solar lamps and the comforting glow that surrounded the one street lamp on Grace's road. Cloud cover had obliterated the stars, and a light rain had begun to fall, pattering gently against the window as if not wanting to interrupt. Leah didn't blame it. Who was brave enough to cut off Grace in full flow? Of course, each grape is different, she was saying. You have your Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, that kind of thing. But it's the blend that really makes the wine. You've probably all heard of Malbec, but... Leah looked across the room and caught Monica's eye. Both women glanced away quickly and Leah had to fight the urge to giggle. The kind of bubbling laughter that she remembered from school. The type you'd get in the class of a strict teacher. Deliciously forbidden and highly dangerous. She tried to concentrate on Grace's words. Perhaps I meant that all along, she was saying of the Bordeaux idea. Yes, I did wonder about wine. Alfie piped up, unwisely into the silence. Oh, would it be OK if I brought a bit of... Ah, then, young man, you can consider this your education, Grace said enthusiastically. We'll convert you by the end, I'm sure of it. Alfie nodded, sitting back on his chair and pushing his glasses back up his nose. He was a bit of an anomaly in this group of forty and fifty-somethings, with his band T-shirt and black-rimmed glasses, enormous white trainers and the small spray of acne at his jawline. Leah wondered whether he'd meant to come to the group at all. Perhaps he'd written down the wrong address. He looked more suited to a chess club or some sort of gaming-type organisation. He looked up and caught her eye and she quickly looked away, embarrassed to have been caught staring. She somehow doubted he'd be there next week. We read Oliver at school, he said, cutting Grace off during an anecdote about wine tasting. I just couldn't spit it out, so uncouth, and what a waste, and then I ended up making quite a fool of myself in the vineyard. Grace looked at him. Well, don't let that put you off, she said. I find that school... Oh, no, it didn't, he added hurriedly. Actually, I... Well, I loved it. His finger went to the bridge of his glasses, already firmly fixed on his nose, and gave it a nudge. It was... I found it quite moving, actually, so I think this will be good. The statement seemed so out of place with their assumptions of him that they all fell silent. George cleared his throat. Don't remember doing much at school myself, he said. Mostly just pissed about. Wish I'd read more, really. Grace shuddered slightly at the language, but let it pass. Plenty of time to catch up, she said. I've got a virtual library here, and you're welcome to borrow. Her cheeks looked pink. I can hardly remember anything I read at school, admitted Leah. Then again, it's a lot longer ago for us than you. She looked at Alfie, trying as always to knit everything back together. You'll have to be patient with us oldies. It was one of those things that you say, then sit for the next ten minutes wondering why you let yourself say it. It made them seem, she thought later, completely past it. Not that long ago for all of us, Grace said. Her brow furrowed, despite the fact that she was older than Leah by over a decade. Right then, George said, slapping his thighs and groaning to his feet. Sorry to love you and leave you, but uh, I'd better get on. They all gratefully rose with him. Yes, said Monica. I told the babysitter eight at the latest, so... 
She looked at her watch, a neat strip of weaved gold on her nut-brown wrist. Oh, you have a child, Grace asked, looking at Monica's slim frame incredulously. They hadn't actually asked. They'd dutifully given their names and occupations during the introductions, shared a few basic facts, but nothing deeper. Still, it was a surprise that Monica hadn't mentioned she was a mum, especially after Leah had told them all about Scarlet. Oh, she's just a baby, Monica said. Three months old. Bella. But you don't. Look, Grace began, before falling silent. Here she is. Monica pulled a white phone from her pocket and expertly scrolled with her thumb. She passed Grace a picture of a baby wearing a hat with teddy ears and looking at the camera with enormous brown eyes. Lovely, Grace said decisively, barely glancing at the screen before passing the phone quickly to Leah. The others made the appropriate noises as they inspected Bella en route to the front door. Well, thanks again, George began, his hand on the catch, brandishing his book, as if to remind Grace that she'd given it to him. Uh, this has been... Oh, I almost forgot, Grace interrupted, picking up a digital camera that had clearly been placed on the hall table for the purpose. We ought to capture this first meeting, don't you think? For posterity? Without waiting for a response, she set a timer on the camera and placed it down, then rushed to the wall opposite. That's it. All together. And you'll need to bend slightly, George. And hold the books up. The camera flashed. Leah, leaning against the wall with the rest of them, wondered if they looked more like a police lineup than a book club. Most of their expressions were startled and unprepared. Thanks so much for coming, Grace said. So, shall we say first Friday in March to start? Here? Say about seven-ish? I'll lay on a bit of a spread. And of course... Some wine. With various mumbles in the affirmative, Monica, Alfie and George stepped onto the wooden porch with its hanging baskets and enormous terracotta pots before being swallowed up into the early February night. Do you want me to? Leah asked, hanging back, aware that their mugs and plates were still scattered in Grace's immaculate living room. No, not a problem, Grace said firmly. You get back to that husband of yours. She said the word husband with a slight inflection of distaste. Up early tomorrow, getting the rotavator out, didn't you say? Yes, Leah said, smiling, pleased that Grace had remembered. She wrapped her coat around her as she stepped from the warmth of Grace's home to the bitter cold of the winter air. Her breath clouded in front of her and she made it quickly to her Renault Scenic and wrenched open the door. Inside... She rubbed her hands together vigorously before sliding in the keycard and pressing start. She felt the flood of relief she did after most social... She knew that they were good for her and that the more she did, the better she'd get at them. But it was nice to disappear back into her head for a bit and not have to worry about what other people were thinking. As she pulled away, she wondered whether Nathan had managed to knock together any semblance of dinner. Grace remained on the freezing porch, dressed only in the blouse and pleated skirt she'd worn inside, waving until they all disappeared into the night. Chapter Two Half an hour later, Leah bumped the scenic along her driveway, almost running over one of her neighbour's cats, which skittered in her wake. She switched off the car and listened for the automatic handbrake to click into place then opened the door and stepped into the cold. Inside, she could hear Nathan clattering around in the kitchen. At least she assumed it was Nathan rather than Scarlet, who, at fourteen, wouldn't be seen dead listening to Nathan's Naughty's playlist, all the tunes that had entertained them both during their younger years. As she listened, a new intro began, and she recognised the strains of the Pussycat Dolls. Yep, definitely Nathan. Hello, she said automatically as she stepped into the tiled hallway and hung her coat on the peg above the radiator. But of course, nobody replied. Nathan was getting his groove on whilst, hopefully, putting something together for their dinner. And Scarlet? Well, getting a nicety out of Scarlet would be startling these days. 
Her daughter spent most of her time in her bedroom, chatting to her friends on WhatsApp or TikTok, or begging for a lift and disappearing to her best friend Mathilde's house. Hi, Leah said again, pushing open the door of the kitchen, her nostrils flaring as she tried to ascertain the source of the smell. Soup of some kind? Her husband stood at the aga with his back to her. He was wearing his habitual muddy jeans and wellies, with a washed-out, checkered shirt and apron, whilst moving his hips and jiggling to the words, hot like me, as he stirred an enormous stainless steel saucepan on the hob. Smiling, she moved up behind him and wrapped her hands around his waist, only to have him jump a mile and turn, wooden spoon brandished like a weapon. Oh, God, it's only you he said, thankfully lowering the spoon once he realised. Leah wondered briefly what death by wooden spoon might feel like. How many days would it take? Would it make a difference if he was cooking something hot or stirring a dessert? Her musing was cut off when she saw his features turn from surprise to what looked like annoyance. Sorry, she said, didn't mean to... He turned around and put the wooden spoon back in the saucepan, turning down the heat a little. The steam had warmed and reset his usual well-gelled hair, and it flopped forward over his forehead, boyishly. Are you OK? Leah checked her watch. It wasn't yet 8pm, so about the time she said she'd be. Not that Nathan was a stickler for timing or anything. But he seemed disgruntled. What do you think? he said, looking at her pointedly, one eyebrow raised. Leah resisted the urge to smooth the tousled brow back into place. I'm sorry, she said. You've lost me. Oh, come on. He was serious, she realised. She tried to think of anything she might have done to upset him. Nathan, stop being weird. If I've done something wrong, just tell me, she said, trying to keep her tone light. What with Scarlet's constant moods, she could do without another smouldering grump in the house. He turned, his features unreadable. Let's just say, I'm making carrot soup, he said, the eyebrow travelling back up his forehead again. Well, that's lovely, she said, still confused. I mean, yum, yay, soup, um... She trailed off. Carrot soup, he said again. She wondered briefly how far an incredulous eyebrow could travel... If the incredulity level was high enough, could it begin to travel to the top of the head? Where would it stop? She focused on the hairy caterpillar interestedly. I like carrot soup, she said. I bet you do, he said, shaking his head. I bet you do. She put her bag down and sat on one of their bar stools, sourced from the local déchetterie after they'd fashioned the breakfast bar using an enormous piece of oak that they'd found in the stone barn attached to the property. She leaned her elbows on the worn wood, waxed by then both for days last year and still gratifyingly smooth. Love, she said, no offence, but I'm completely knackered. I seriously don't know what you're talking about. He looked at her, his eyes searching her face. Then he slumped, the angry energy seeping out of him. The carrots, he said. Yes. You bought them. Once again he was tense. Yes, from the supermarket. Then she realised what he was getting at. Oh, look, she said hurriedly. I'm sure your carrots are going to be lovely when they finally um, kick in, but there just wasn't enough. She felt his eyes on her. His eyebrows were now so high, she wondered if it was possible to pull... Meeting her gaze, something in him changed, as if someone had let a little air out and deflated all his features. He switched the heat from under the steel saucepan and sat down on the stool opposite her. I'm being stupid, he said. She didn't reply. It was hard to know whether to agree. I just... He reached for her hand and took it in both of his. She felt the roughness of his skin against hers, saw the stubborn mud embedded under some of his nails that simply didn't seem to want to shift. I thought we'd do better this year. 
Carrots had been the first thing they'd tried when they'd finally rotivated their garden and started their growing project three years ago. They're meant to be easy, Nathan had said. Start off simple. Since, they'd grown several other vegetables with varying degrees of success. Potatoes, a glut of cucumbers, which surged into life each June and seemed to disappear soon afterwards, leaving them giving cucumbers to pretty much everyone they knew and having to buy from the shop the rest of the year. Green beans and radishes, which did really well, but which admittedly neither of them liked very much. But the carrots had never really taken off. Nathan, who seemed to be relentlessly optimistic about his prowess as a grower, had hoped this season would be the one where they finally produced enough to feed them each week. Oh, Nathan, she said, it's only February. I know. We don't know what we'll find when we dig those others up. Those enormous shoots, she said. I know. So what if I had to top up um this week's crop, she said. It's just... He looked at her, his brown eyes serious and searching. It feels like a criticism, somehow, you buying carrots, those pathetic four we were going to use, then that enormous bag... He trailed off. You're being daft. I know. He sighed, leaning against the counter. It shouldn't really matter, should it? God's sake, they're only 80 cents a kilo anyway. I know, she said, but I get it, I really do. She'd felt a similar attachment to the strawberries she'd tried to nurture over the past three summers, with varying success. The day she'd woken to find that slugs had dispatched the crop she'd earmarked for an eaten mess had been a dark day indeed. She felt her insides sink a little, as she wondered yet again whether they'd ever achieve anything close to self-sufficiency. The remote copywriting job she'd managed to land to provide an interim income was part-time, but it pinned her to set hours. A routine. Something she'd hoped to stay away from after their move. And while she enjoyed writing, she'd hoped she might be able to do something creative once they'd moved to France, rather than being pa a shoe company that specialised in footwear for those with bunions and other nuisance foot complaints. But it wouldn't be fair to raise this, not now, especially when Nathan was already so upset. She leaned forward and cuddled him, and he sank into her embrace. I bet your carrots are much better than those store-bought ones anyway, she said into his ear. Thanks, he said, meaning it. She remembered the dynamic editor she'd met when they'd worked together on the Cambridge News. He'd have laughed at this, but she shook the image away. They were building their dream. It was nice that he was so invested. It hadn't been the work so much as the relentlessness of it that had made them look for another sort of life. Nathan had thrived on editing, doling out assignments to junior reporters, sorting the wheat from the chaff when it came to local events, and she'd enjoyed her time as a local reporter. But arriving home each evening and disappearing first thing in the morning had left them little time to spend together. With their enormous mortgage, dialing back on the hours was out of the question. Instead, they'd quit, sold up and taken a leap, and it was wonderful in so many ways. Just once in a while, she'd look at him, covered in mud and sweat, or see herself in the mirror, hair in disarray, or check their dwindling balance and feel a surge of fear, and wonder whether they'd simply swapped one difficult situation for another. Chickens are laying lots this week, he said. Getting to his feet, his voice returning to its habitual positive tone. Thought I might make frittatas. Lovely. I've shut them up. Put in some extra hay. It's going to be two degrees later. <laughs> Poor things. Ah, they've got feathers. They'll be fine. He grinned as he turned towards her, his mood seemingly lifted. Unless you want to let them in. Have them all by the fire. Not likely. She shuddered. She loved the idea of chickens from a distance. When they discussed their plans a few years ago, she'd talked of collecting eggs, even eating their own chickens sometimes. When confronted with the scrawny, feathered reality of them, their sharp beaks, beady eyes and strange, jerking movements, she'd felt less enthusiastic. These days the chickens were solely Nathan's domain. He laughed. I didn't think so. 
Oh, you know me. I love them, really. Just from a distance. Definitely from a distance, she grinned. How is book group, he said, decanting some of the soup into Tupperware and setting it aside to cool. She shrugged. OK, there were a few of us there. He nodded. Grace on form? Grace is always on... Good point, he said. The door to the kitchen opened suddenly, hitting the wall behind, and Scarlet appeared in the room, somehow flooding it with an emotional charge. She was wearing her pyjama bottoms and an enormous black T-shirt with a picture of Kurt Cobain sketched onto it. This was a recent obsession, and Leah wondered at times whether she'd chosen this particular role model simply to worry her. Topping the ensemble off was one of Nathan's enormous wool cardigans, acquired from a local Christmas craft market, which hung heavily on her daughter's permanently cold shoulders. "'When's food?' she asked, her face unsmiling. "'Hello, Mum. How's your day?' Leah found herself saying. It was the type of thing her mum had used to say to her as a teen, and she'd vowed never to adopt the same verbal clichés. Yet here they were. Scarlet gave her the kind of look the sarcastic comment deserved, then moved across the kitchen to look into the saucepan. I hate soup, she said. Why can't we eat any normal food in this house? Leah thought of the eleven-year-old who'd skipped into the house when they'd first brought her over, had squealed when they'd told her they were getting chickens, the girl who'd helped peel vegetables from the allotment and look up recipes for cucumbers. There were few, online during the glut. The girl who had seemed to pick up French with rapidity and ease and was able to chatter away with her friends from school within a term. Until recently, Leah had been certain that the whole teenage phase, and she remembered her own struggles at that age, couldn't possibly be as horrible as depicted on TV or on internet forums. Sure, she'd had her own difficulties back in the day, but that was then. These days, parents were so much more clued up on the psychology of it all, She'd convinced herself she and Scarlet, with their closeness and shared humour and the amount of time they were able to spend together, would buck the trend and remain close despite the hormones. Yet a year ago, it was as if someone had spirited away her little, happy, cuddly daughter in the night and replaced her with a snarly, prickly version, the type of person who had you treading on eggshells, who moved away from cuddles who found things to criticise in almost everything Leah did. Leah had read the books, and she knew the part that hormones played. She knew that children needed to separate from their parents in order to become fully-fledged adults, and she thought she'd be OK with it, until it began to happen. To her own surprise, she'd been so bereft since Scarlet had pulled away that she'd become like a needy ex, craving her daughter's attention and approval, despite realising this made her seem pathetic. It wasn't much fun viewing herself through a teenage girl's eyes. Scarlet's lip curled a little. So? Well, the least you could do is try a bit. It smells delicious, she said loyally. I'm not hungry. The door to the kitchen closed behind her retreating daughter. Nathan and Leah exchanged eye contact. Just ignore her, he said. She doesn't mean it. I know, but... I know, he said ladling soup into small bowls and breaking off some of the loaf they'd painstakingly baked this morning. It was a simple white pain. They'd dialed back on anything adventurous since the case of the wholemeal sourdough, with its unyielding crust that even the chickens had refused to peck. He brought it to her without a plate, but she managed not to say anything, although, really, why not just grab a plate? Just because they were living the good life didn't mean they had to live in a complete mess, too. After they'd finished the soup and stacked the dishes in the dishwasher together, Leah wandered through to the living room and sank into their leather sofa, feeling the worn material creak beneath her. She'd tried to ignore the sound of Nathan removing and restacking the dishes in the way he called doing it properly. Instead, she pulled a tartan rug over her knees and felt herself begin to relax as warmth flooded through her. Nathan had lit the wood burner earlier, and it radiated a comforting heat. The shutters were still open, and, despite the slight bite of draught she could feel from the single-paned windows, it was lovely to look out into the darkness. The rain had stopped now, 
The clouds cleared, and the sky was sprinkled with jewel-like stars. The moon, almost a full one, she noticed, glowed coldly in the blackness, giving just enough light to make out the fields that dropped away from their house into a small valley, then rose again, their tops decorated with dark fir trees. She pulled great expectations out of her bag, noting that it was an old library book from the UK. The last borrower, if the piece of stamped paper in the front cover was to be believed, had been in 1993. She turned the pages, inhaling the scent of well-read book, that comforting, papery smell, and began to read. Chapter 3 2. Bordeaux Book Club from Grace. Subject, Confirmation. Dear all, lovely to meet you all yesterday. Just wanted to confirm that the first meeting of the Bordeaux Book Club will be on Friday the 7th of March. That gives us three weeks to enjoy great expectations. I'll provide the wine for this one.